Absolutely. I'm just watching the participants. We're up to 187, almost touching 200 now. So I'll just give folk a bit of time just to get on. And then um, I'll introduce you. Um, I'll do some, um, just do some announcements to the viewers. And um, once I'm done with that, then it's over to you, my friend. It's a, such a pleasure to see you again. I haven't seen you since, when was it, 2000, with John, John, John um, Bew's birthday party when the two of us sat at it's the back of the bus? Yeah, it That's was, absolutely. Yeah. Can't believe it's, um, it's just yeah. flown, Patrick. So we're touching 300 at the moment, so we're doing well. Um, we had between seven and 800 folk um, registered, so I think we're just going to let things um, run a little bit longer. Yeah, we were just discussing, talking about the, um, the whole COVID pandemic just earlier, Patrick, and you were saying that you guys are still at level five. Yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, restrictions were lifted over the Christmas period and holiday season kicked in and yeah. numbers went a little bit out of control. So, you know, we've kind of learned to live with it, but it's been level five up until May. Yeah. So we've had about five months of it continuously since Christmas to May. Um, but, yeah. And your vaccination program? Yeah, it's, it could be better. I think, you know, I suppose when you're dealing with a national health service, you know, it's it's not going to be as efficient as normally as the private sector would be able to roll it out. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's 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 goals often put out there, but they don't often reach those goals. Mm, absolutely. Patrick, we're over 300. Um, I think what I'll do is it seems to have stabilized. So what I'll do is I'm going to start because, mm -hmm. as I said, we, we have 8 o'clock as our cutoff time because, um, as I explained, we're on this... Um, on uh, this uh, national load shedding schedule. And it might mean that some of the participants may need to jump off um, when it gets close to eight o'clock. So good evening, dear colleagues. It's um, really such a pleasure to have you with us this evening. And it's such a pleasure to have Patrick McEwen with us all the way from Ireland. I've known Patrick for several years and um, I have a great respect for the work that um, Patrick does and um, it's just so um, interesting and it's just so enlightening and I know that this evening's presentation will be the same. Um, Patrick is a world-renowned author and breathing practitioner. He was educated at Trinity College in Dublin before completing his clinical training in the Buteyko breathing method at the Buteyko Clinic in Moscow, Russia. Um, this training was accredited by Professor Constantine Buteyko himself. So that introduces Patrick to a little degree. Before we get going, I just need to um, give you some house rules. Number one, please refrain from using the raised hand. Type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab, or even better still, um, um, yeah, that'll be better rather than in the chat function. CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform and you will be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. Um, we are streaming live on YouTube also. So just in case you have difficulty accessing the Zoom platform, please try the YouTube platform. After the countdown has started, um, oh, that's that's for me. So um, there we go. Right, and then before we uh, continue, I just want to announce that Patrick <clears throat> has been very kind enough to provide us with um, ten autograph books of his latest book called um, uh, "Gosh, uh, 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 the breathing there, cure." The breathing cure. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and we're going to be giving away these 10 books, but there is a catch to it. Um, at the end of the presentation, there is a questionnaire that um, survey that you need to fill in. And in the comments section, um, if you could fill in the uh, given answer to the following question, what was the key takeaway from tonight's presentation? And how do you think you can implement that in your practice to improve your dentistry. The best 10 um, answers evaluated by myself, 
Patrick will then um, qualify for um, the 10 books. Um, that's it. So just to continue, um, besides Patrick being a Bottega breathing technician, please excuse me, you could probably hear my, um, um, Patrick, my, uh, my battery backup system kicking in there. Besides Patrick McEwen being a Bottega breathing cl clinician, he is also a researcher and an internationally um, best-selling author of books on breathing and breathing dysfunction. He is president of Bottega Professionals International and designer of the Myotape, which is a circum oral tape designed to help guide and train lip closure, especially when sleeping. His book, The Oxygen Advantage, describes multiple physiological advantages of nasal breathing, um, over mouth breathing, the consequences of which disrupts craniofacial respiratory growth and development. Patrick is also very widely regarded as one of the leads, world's leading breathing re-education um, experts. So good luck to you all. Enjoy tonight's presentation. It's fascinating. Patrick is a wonderful speaker and knows his subject through and through. So Patrick, welcome to South Africa, my friend, even if it's on the ether. And it is a privilege and honor to have you present to us this evening. So over to you. Um, and Patrick, just as a reminder, at about 45 minutes, I'll just chip in just to remind you that we will need to switch over to question and answer session so we can end by about 8 p.m. Thank you, Patrick. You take care. Thank you. Thank you, Dittmar. Um, Hello, everybody. So basically, for the next 45 minutes, I want to unfold and to examine in terms of the importance of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, but also much more than that, because the nose is very much often it's underrated. But when we talk about breathing, we have to consider if we are breathing through the nose versus the mouth, what is the difference? Does the mouth employ any functions in terms of breathing? Does it warm the incoming air? Does it moisten the incoming air? Does it harness nasal nitric oxide? Is the mouth connected with the diaphragm or is it connected with the upper chest? Does the mouth have to regulate volume? What does the mouth do in terms of breathing? And the answer is nothing. The, the, the mouth has absolutely no function in terms of breathing. And if you think of evolution and if you think of the size of the nasal cavity and the fact that the nasal cavity is sitting right just above the mouth, you know, that the floor, of the, the floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth, or the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose, that nature doesn't waste space. And evolution has equipped us with a nose. And once breathing through it, it can have quite a very, very positive impact on somebody's health. But if children or adults are breathing through an open mouth, and I don't mean that they are breathing through it 100% of the time, but normally for a human being, they will spend some time breathing through an open mouth. And we know that children, study children, between 25 to 50% of them are persistent mouth breathers. Now, I will say that no child is going to reach their full potential unless they switch to nasal breathing and adopt functional breathing patterns. I was that child. And in primary school, I was very bright. I was pretty much top of the class. But in secondary school or high school, I went from the top of the class down to the bottom of the class. I was the kid falling asleep in school and I didn't realize at the time I had sleep disorder breathing. My nose was chronically stuffed up. This forces mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is forcing upper chest breathing. Upper chest breathing is putting that person into a state of agitation or fight or flight. It was only in 1997 that I read a newspaper article about the importance of breathing through the nose. And I did a nose and blocking exercise, which I'll show you later. I switched to nasal breathing. It was a little bit of a struggle. I kept my nose closed during, sorry, my mouth closed during sleep, breathing through my nose during sleep. And I woke up, um, you know, the following morning and it was the best night's sleep I had in about 15 years. Any of you listening here, 50% of the adult population wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. You are not likely to wake up feeling refreshed. And not only is your sleep quality going to be imp impacted, but also your concentration. We know that children with sleep disorder breathing, they have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties. We also know from a study by Karen Bonnock investigating 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon that children with sleep disorder breathing, of which mouth breathing is a contributory factor, 
if it's untreated by age five, these kids are 40% have a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. So when we think of children and the fact that, you know, of all of the professionals who have such a positive contribution to make to the, the health of a child, it's the dentist. And my argument is as follows. We go to the dentist every six months or so. A child will visit the dentist very, very frequently. An adult will also visit the dentist frequently. I, as a man, I don't visit a medical doctor frequently. I've been once to a medical doctor in 20 years, and I'm sure I'm not unique. But when I go to the dentist, I would like the dentist to be able to spot the risk factors for sleep apnea. And the dentist is an ideal position to spot these risk factors. Whether it's a child or whether it's an adult, and if you think of the incidence of sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea in the adult population, it's monstrous. It affects 26% of men aged between 30 and 50 years of age. It affects 43% of men aged between 50 and 70 years of age. And with females, it's 9% of females aged between 30 and 50 years of age. And once the female goes through menopause, it increases between 200 and 300%. So the risk factors would be, um, you know, high upper narrow palate, scalloping on the tongue, compromised airway, overcrowding of teeth. And when we're thinking about teeth, we have to consider overcrowding of teeth should be a major health concern. It's not just about the aesthetics, because if a child or an adult is overcrowding of teeth, it indicates that their jaw is small. Their jaw is too small to house all teeth adequately. And if the jaw is too small, where is the tongue going to go? The tongue doesn't have enough room in the roof of the mouth. And as a result, the tongue is more likely to encroach the airway. And if we think of the human airway, if we think of the, the space at the back of the nose and the nasopharynx, or the space at the back of the mouth, the oropharynx, or if we think of the throat itself, a good airway is the size of our tongue in an adult's airway. We don't have much room for, for compromised air. And a child who's growing up with their mouth open, not only is it going to contribute to craniofacial abnormalities, not only can it contribute to cognit cognit cognitive um, underdevelopment, but those traits that that child, during the formative years, that child will have those traits for the rest of one's life. That's why I say children who are mouth breathing, if mouth breathing is untreated, these kids will never reach their, inher their full inherited potential. Now, it might sound that that's like a tall order, but this has been debated in dentistry since 1909. And if we look at the function of the nose, since 1988, Swift was a researcher and he looked at individuals who had their jaws wired shut post-jaw surgery, that when they were forced to continuously breathe through their nose, the PO2, the pressure of oxygen in the blood increased by 10%. Nasal breathing is greater, it, it involves greater amplitude of the diaphragm. And the diaphragm breathing muscle is what separates the chest from the abdomen. And the diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but the diaphragm is also connected with the emotions. And the diaphragm is also connected with the upper airway dilator muscles. So we have a subset, of, we have a set of muscles in the throat, 20 muscles in total. And these are responsible for a number of different activities. And it's a subset of these muscles which function to help maintain an open airway. But when we breathe through the mouth, we tend to breathe using the upper chest. And upper chest breathing is reducing lung volume. And when there's a lung reduction to lung volume, the throat is more liable to collapse. Mouth breathing is drying out the upper airways. As a result, it can contribute to inflammation. Inflammation can lead to narrowing of the upper airways. This in turn can contribute to resistance and also contribute to collapse of the upper airways. So whether it's a total collapse, it's called an apnea. That's when the individual, the adult stops breathing for 10 seconds or more during sleep. Or for a child, if they stop breathing for two breaths, that's all it needs to take. And when we're looking at sleep disorder breathing in the childhood population, it's much, much different to adults. So for example, the AHI index with children, mild sleep apnea is between one and five events. For an adult, it's between five and 10. And moderate for a child is between five, five and 10. And for, a, for an adult, it's between, um, sorry, for an adult, it's between five and 15. 
So moderate, I'll just go through those again. So the AHI index for, for adults are mild obstructive sleep apnea is between five and 15 events per hour. Moderate for an adult is between 15 to 30 events per hour. And severe sleep apnea is 30 events plus. But for a child, mild sleep apnea is between one and five events per hour. Even if the child just has one event per hour, it's cl clinically significant. No child should snore. And even in studies, when you, when you dig deeper into this, that even children who are snoring, it will impact their cognitive development, it will impact their academic development, and it will also contribute to ADD and ADHD. So is it easy to fix? And you may say, well, you know, what's the chicken and the egg? Is the child, do they have a narrow mouth and a high upper palate and overcrowding of teeth because of genetics? Or is it that they develop poor habits such as, you know, tongue sucking or mouth breathing? And um, they didn't have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. They may have tongue tied, they didn't have adequate breastfeeding, etc. There's a number of different factors which contribute to mouth breathing in children. And we don't, of course, we don't know exactly which factors because it's a multitude and it's more complex. But here's the thing. If a child presents with mouth breathing and if a child presents with a high upper narrow palate and if the child presents with their jaw set back and overcrowding of teeth, narrow jaws, etc., the dentist is in a wonderful position to not only spot it, but also to do something about it. Doesn't matter the cause, if it's genetics or if it's if it's environmental, you know, is it epigenetics? Doesn't matter. I was the mouth breeder and no dentist had ever told me when I was vis visiting them as a child to breathe through my, my, my nose. But all I can remember was this, for me to get grades in school, it took a lot of work. Because if you don't wake up with good energy and if you don't have that focus and concentration, you don't have the ability to get the grades that you need to, to get. And society demands that we concentrate. Many of you as adults, you know it yourself. If you wake up after a poor night's sleep, you're going to wake up feeling groggy and you, you're not going to have the, the attention that day. Children are the same, you know? So it's so simple, nose versus mouth breathing. But we have to ask one question. Is it logical? Does it have, com is it common sense? And what does the mouth do in terms of breathing? It does nothing. So when we think of the breath, I'm gonna go through a couple of simple things. Snoring, which is something that's very prevalent. And you know what I would like you to do is to demonstrate a snore sound through your mouth. And it goes like this. And now what I would like you to do is to close your mouth and try and snore through your mouth with your mouth closed. Can you snore through your mouth with your mouth closed? And the answer is no. The second type of snoring is nasal snoring. And that's when there's turbulence in the nasal pharynx and the nasal cavity. And this goes a little bit like this. <laughs> so now what I would like you to do is to make that sound of a snore through your nose. What do you have to do to make that sound? You have to breathe harder and you have to tighten the airway or restrict the airway. So now with your lips together, I would like you to really slow down the speed of your breathing and breathe very slowly in through your nose and then have a relaxed and gentle breath out. And then a very slow, gentle breath into your nose and a relaxed and a gentle breath out. And as you breathe slowly, try to snore. Sinead, I... So as you breathe slowly, try to snore and you'll find that it's very difficult or it's more difficult to snore as you breathe slow. Snoring is not due to just and solely a compromised airway. We have to think of the airway from the point of view of an engineer. And if an engineer is looking at a tube, the engineer is going to look at the diameter of the tube, but also to look at the flow. When we look at the airway, the focus is primarily on the airway itself, on the tube, on the diameter of the tube. And what's been overlooked is, is flow. Flow is... How fast and hard do you breathe? And when we look at breathing pattern disorders in the population, as I said, in the childhood population, mouth breathing is a breathing pattern disorder, and it affects between 25 and 50% of studied children. In the adult population, breathing pattern disorders affect 10% of the normal population, 30% of the adult population, 
75% of the anxiety population. A breathing pattern disorder is when we're breathing a little bit faster and upper chest with a regular breathing or more effort for breathing or mouth breathing. It doesn't have to be, it's not so evident. You can have many patients in front of you. You're not going to spot it so, so, so readily. It's quite hidden. But yet, that breathing pattern disorder is going to impact that person's life across a number of different factors. One is the emotions. Because when you're breathing fast and when you're breathing upper chest, you're more likely to have agitation of the mind. You're more likely to be prone to anxiety, to have racing mind, poor concentration, poor academic ability, etc. In terms of um, gas exchange, when you're breathing fast and upper chest, it's going to reduce oxygen transfer from the lungs over to the blood. It's inefficient. It's uneconomical. When you're talking about people with lower back pain, 50% of the population with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing patterns. So the diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but it also provides stabilization for the spine. And when we look at breathing, we need to look at breathing from a biochemical point of view, a biomechanical point of view, and also resonance frequency. And what I mean by that is that with a biochemical point of view, I was a mouth breather for many years, and it's likely that my carbon dioxide was too low. Now, not all mouth breathers will have low carbon dioxide, but I always had cold hands and cold feet. And when I switched to nose breathing, and I started to reduce my breathing, reduce the volume of air I was breathing, for periods of time throughout the day, I brought temperature into my hands. So cold hands are not the sign of a warm heart, but cold hands can be the sign that you have a dysfunctional breathing pattern. It's not just your hands that are cold when you breathe too hard and too fast. And I'm talking about persistently and habitually breathing that way. Any mouth breather is typically going to be breathing faster and harder and more upper chest. Blood vessels constrict. And not only do blood vessels constrict, but less oxygen is delivered throughout the body. This is not new information. This was discovered back in 1904 by Christian Bohr, a Danish physiologist. And he said that the carbon dioxide pressure in the blood is a catalyst for the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. So you think as human beings that we're taking a breath of air into our lungs and oxygen transfers from the lungs into the blood and 98% of oxygen in the blood is carried by hemoglobin. But what is a factor that causes hemoglobin to release oxygen to where it's needed, to tissues, to the cells, to organs. And one of those catalysts is carbon dioxide. So you're probably aware that if I said to you, take five or 10 big breaths in and out through your mouth, that you may feel lightheaded. That's not a, su that's not a sign of super oxygenation, but that's the sign that you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. So the five or 10 big breaths in and out through the mouth, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. And as a result, blood vessels are constricting. And also less oxygen is being delivered throughout the body. Now, if you think of the mouth breathing child who comes into you, so the mouth breathing child will tend to have a dry mouth. They're more prone to dental cavities. They'll be more prone to bad breath, for example. They're more prone to trauma in the upper airways. So if you think of that child who is mouth breathing, snoring at night, there's a lot of trauma to the upper airways there. If you have snoring and sleep disorder breathing, as I said, you cannot function. And when we look at the whole, you know, in, in terms of sleep and how it's changed over the last seven years. So it's really, I suppose, starting off with an observation and it's probably starting off with yourself. If you wake up with your, your mouth dry in the morning, you're not likely to be waking up feeling refreshed. Are you snoring hard during sleep? Do you stop breathing during sleep? Does your partner stop breathing during sleep? Do your children have their mouths open? And do you notice that when your children's are mouth breathing, those same kids, do they have difficulty concentrating? Does it impact their mood? Does it impact their dental health? Do those kids that you see who are coming in mouth breathing, those kids with asthma, those kids with chronic rhinitis, you know, many children have chronic rhinitis. It's probably about 30% of people, in, children in the Western world. So 30% of kids and they're coming in, they're sitting in their chair, they have their mouth open, they're breathing onto your mirror. It's 
gassing up their mirror. You're asking the child to breathe through the nose. They find difficulty breathing through the nose because they feel air hunger. That's a habit that can be very easily addressed. And that's where breathing re-education comes in. So by teaching children and adults simple breathing techniques to help switch, first of all, to decongest the nose, then to switch to nasal breathing, then to improve their functional breathing patterns. So I'm going to show you just a, a brief review. Well, it's not a brief one. It was 10,000 words, but I'll show it to you briefly. And this was a review that I had published with two ear, nose and throat doctors, and it's available on PubMed. So if you go into PubMed and if you put in my name, you'll see the application of breathing re-education for sleep. This is looking at the adult population, but even still a lot of this is going to apply to children. So it was only published last month. And I spoke about breathing that we, we need to look, what does it involve? Well, it's about establishing full-time nasal breathing during wakefulness and sleep. So I'm just getting a pen here just to write. So bear with me one second. And it's also about correcting the resting posture of the tongue because we need the tongue to be resting in the roof of the mouth. But if you have your mouth open, you're not able to have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. And if you consider that if we don't have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, where is the tongue likely to, to, to encroach? And it encroaches the airway. It's very important to slow down and practice slowing down the respiratory rate, both for mental health, but also for improving the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So for example, if you have somebody who's in sympathetic drive, if they're in a stressed out state, by slowing down the respiratory rate, we can stimulate the vagus nerve. It secretes the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This causes a slowing of the heart, but it also helps to bring the body into relaxation. Using breath hold time to establish chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. And when we're looking at these, we're looking at this in terms of the overall aspect of breathing patterns and how to improve them, but also the application of them to sleep. Restoring dive from function with lateral expansion of the lower ribs and reducing the minute volume towards normal to regulate levels of CO2. So since 2013, sleep medicine has changed fundamentally and it's especially changed in the area of sleep, sleep apnea. That obstructive sleep apnea is not just an anatomical issue. That there are four phenotypes. One is anatomical, but three are non-anatomical. And all four phenotypes are influenced by how you breed. So for example, when we have the mouth closed, we have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. This helps to open up the airways. A more open airway reduces resistance during breathing. When we breathe through the nose, the nose is more likely to be connected with the diaphragm and we've got greater amplitude of the diaphragm. By having greater amplitude of the diaphragm, it provides stabilization of the spine. It's also very important, as I said, with the emotions. And in terms of sleep, when we improve the movement of the diaphragm, it increases lung volume. And by increasing lung volume, it causes a stiffening of the throat, that the throat is less likely to collapse. By breathing through the nose, our breathing is more likely to be slower. And with slower breathing, it helps to give adequate gas exchange from the lungs into the blood. But slow breathing is also important for helping to maintain a calm mental state. Because typically as human beings, when we get stressed, it's accompanied by faster and shallow breathing. But faster and shallow breathing also feeds into stress. And faster and shallow breathing is more likely to waken us from sleep. So sleep, for example, we're talking about insomnia. If you have somebody with agitation of the mind, if you have a lot of stress going through your mind, it's difficult to fall asleep. But if you breathe fast and shallow during sleep, you're more likely to be awoken from sleep. When we look at breath hold time, and I have you do this, and this is more relevant to adults, but there is a phenotype in sleep apnea called loop gain. And in 2018, a Harvard medical doctor, Messino, he established that you can assess high loop gain in the sleep apnea population by measuring their breath hold time. Now, the relevance of this is 30% of people, adults with OSA with obstructive sleep apnea, have what's called high loop gain. 
and individuals with high loop gain mandibular advancement is not going to work as effectively because high loop gain is an anatomical trait and mandibular advancement is isn't sorry high loop gain is a non-anatomical trait and mandibular advancement is helping to open up the airway so if a patient comes into you and you see that the patient is breathing fast and breathing shallow and breathing using the upper chest this in turn is going to affect their sleep patterns and with somebody with a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide somebody with high loop gain when they stop breathing during sleep, because they have such a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, as they stop breathing, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood because it cannot leave the body through the lungs. And when they resume breathing, they resume breathing with such exaggerated ventilation that they go from high CO2 during the stopping of the breath to low CO2 upon the resumption of breathing. What happens here is, the low carbon dioxide also presents a problem because carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. And when carbon dioxide in the blood is low, the brain doesn't send a signal to breathe. And this can initiate a central sleep, a central apnea, but also when the brain doesn't send adequate signals to breathe, the output from the brain to the upper airway dilator muscles is also reduced. So we think of sleep apnea it's not just about the anatomy. We also have to consider insomnia or the phenotype arousal threshold. We also have to consider upper airway recruitment. How do we get these upper airway muscles doing their job? We also have to consider loop gain, individuals with poor breathing. And it's only by looking at all four phenotypes. And as I said, 43% of the male population coming into you age between 50 and 70 years of age are predisposed to obstructive sleep apnea. Maybe you are going to be some of those people. Is it enough to think of sleep apnea as an anatomical factor? But we have to look at all four phenotypes. So that's in terms of the, the application of breathing re-education for the adult population. And many of the, the factors here have also relevance to children. So from breathing from a biochemical point of view, that when you breathe light, that when you have light and healthy breathing in and out through the nose, it can improve your blood circulation. It can help with your airways. It can also help with oxygen delivery to the tissues. It also in turn will reduce your breathlessness during physical exercise. Because if you have a high or strong sensitivity to carbon dioxide accumulation, you tend to be overly breathless during exercise. You tend to breathe faster in upper chest, but you also tend to breathe harder and faster during sleep. And harder and faster breathing during sleep will translate into increased resistance in the airways, increased snoring, and increased risk of collapse. The biomechanics is about using the diaphragm and using the diaphragm improving lung volume but also helping to increase gas exchange from the lungs into the blood, providing stabilization for the spine and the role it plays in terms of the diaphragm and the emotions. Resonance frequency breathing is about slowing down our breathing for periods of time during the day to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. This helps to stimulate the vagus nerve, to increase heart rate variability, to strengthen the barrel reflex to help bodily systems disturbed by stress. And when we look at this diagram, we see that what's connecting all three dimensions of breathing is nasal breathing. And yet, despite this importance, that your blood circulation and oxygen delivery, your airways, your posture, your emotions, your mental health, your sleep, your autonomic nervous system, all of this is impacted by breathing and nasal breathing is at the core. And this is not, of course, just relevant to adults. To decongest the nose, you can practice this exercise, but don't do it if you're pregnant or if you've got serious medical conditions. It's very simple exercise to decongest the nose. What I would like you to do is take a normal breath in through your nose. It's a silent breath in through your nose and a silent breath out through your nose. And then hold your breath. So pinch your nose with your fingers and stop breathing. 
And as you hold your breath, gently nod your head up and down and continue holding your breath for as long as you can. So continue nodding your head up and down, holding your breath for as long as you can. And when you build up a good air hunger, let go, but breathe in through your nose and get your breathing under control pretty quickly. And then wait about a minute and do it again. And if you do this exercise about six times, you'll find that your nose is helping to open up. So again, the exercise to decongest your nose, even when you have a head cold, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold your nose and gently nod your head up and down, holding your breath for as long as you can. And continue holding the breath until you have a strong air hunger. And then to let go, to breathe in through the nose and to get your breathing back down to normal. So that's a very simple exercise that you can teach children. And those children who are coming in nasal breathers will be better patients. They will be calmer. It's the child coming in with the mouth open, upper chest breathing, faster breathing. It's more likely to be in a fight or flight. So in terms of the phenotypes, I spoke about the four phenotypes and this article here is pretty much going through them. So nasal breathing, correct tongue resting posture, lower prevalence of lateral pharyngeal wall collapse, reduces resistance to breathing during sleep, improves the biochemical dimensions of breathing, the biomechanics, harnesses nasal nitric oxide. These are all good things. These are all positive. And you might be asking, well, how can we help to get the mouth closed during sleep? Well, we use tape, but I'm not going to scare you, I hope. The tape, and this is just, it's, this is the tape that we use ourselves. Um, we use it in terms of for teaching children during wakefulness to restore nasal breathing patterns. It's a cotton tape. It's called a myo tape. So it's easy to remember with myo brace, myo tape. And it's a cotton tape that surrounds the mouth. And it's, it's elasticated. So it brings the lips together, but without covering, without covering them out. So it's in combination of breathing, changing breathing patterns with restoring nasal breathing. That's the key. But before I move on, I'm going to show you something else that's quite important. And this is adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy in children that the efficacy of adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, despite it being a procedure that was carried out for decades, the efficacy was looked at in 2010. And I want to show you the results. And I also want to give you my take on it, that why the results are probably disappointing. So I'm just going to do a share screen to this paper here that was published in the American Thoracic Society Journal. So this is a paper, a study that was conducted and published in 2010. And they looked at 578 children. So age between, sorry, the average age was 6.98 years. So one second here. So 578 children and the average age was 6.9 years. So 50% of the children were obese. Now, I don't know, and tonsillectomy, it did result in a significant reduction in the AHI index from 18.2 to 4.1. But as we said, any child who has a sleep apnea of even one event per hour is too much. So 4.1 is still too much. Now, of the 578 children, only 27% of them had complete resolution of their sleep apnea syndrome. 73% of these kids continue to have residual sleep apnea post-surgery. Now, this is one aspect that needs to be taken into consideration. Why do these children continue to have sleep apnea post-surgery? Is it saying something about that enlarged adenoids and enlarged tonsils are not the only issue that's contributing to sleep apnea in children? Should we be thinking about development of the child's airway? Because when we think of the airway itself, if we look at the anatomical model of the nose, and if the, if the adenoids are enlarged here, enlarged adenoids are relative to the size of the airway itself. But if you have that mouth breathing kid with their mouth open and their tongue is not resting in the roof of the mouth and their tongue is not exerting pressure to help grow forward growth of the face. I was a mouth breather. You see that my nose is bent. You see that my maxilla isn't forward enough in the face. You see that my mandible is set back. You see that my airway would be compromised. 
and my airway is compromised, and my airway as a child was compromised. Yes, I have restored nasal breathing for 20 years. It's made a phenomenal difference to my own health. It's really given me the incentive to put the information out there. But let's come back to this. Why do children have obstructive sleep apnea? Even though the gold standard of treatment is to remove the adenoids, to remove the tonsils, what other, what other factors will contribute to this? We have to talk about development of the jaws. So if the jaws are set back, because even in the adult population, where can collapse of the upper airway happen? One is the soft palate falling in against the throat. One is the tongue falling in against the throat. One is the, the epiglottis falling in against the throat. And one is collapse of the throat itself. We need to help open up this airway. And this is where the dentist is in the wonderful position because they can spot the risk factors for these children. It's not just about cleaning teeth. It's not just about working in a child's teeth. And even in orthodontistry, it's not just about straightening teeth. The airway is more important, you know, because good look, a good, good looking teeth, or sorry, straight teeth don't necessarily create a good looking face. But a good looking face that has developed the way nature has intended it to develop will naturally create straighter teeth. So when we consider, you know, the aesthetics, we shouldn't just be considering the aesthetics. It's not just about straightening the teeth. The real question here to be asking is, what about the airway? If I'm straightening teeth, if somebody is straight, and if an orthodontist is straightening teeth, they have to consider the impact it's having on the airway. And more importantly, is there sufficient room for the tongue? Now, can you have your mouth, can you have your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth with the mouth open? Try having three quarters of your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth and breathe through your mouth. And you'll see that mouth breathers, they drop their tongue. So it's either midway or on the floor of the mouth. And as a result, it's likely, more likely to compromise the airway. There's just one more thing that um, I would like to show you. So just bear with me one second. And it's re relation to um, a paper that was published by Dr. Christian Gimelo. Now, this paper here was looking at children who died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome. Many of you will be familiar with the work of Dr. Christian Gimeno. He was a Stanford-based medical doctor, and he coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea back in the 1970s. Now, sadly, he passed on, I think, either in 2019 or 2020. But for the last five years of his life, he was, has been talking about the critical importance of restoring nasal breathing in children and in adults. So here we have the top sleep doctor in the world. And this paper was published in the European Journal of Pediatrics in April of 2012. This paper points to the importance of looking at the airway in children. Seven children who died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome. I don't know how many of you are parents, but this must be the worst nightmare for any parent to have to go through. And when the autopsy was, was ta taking place, all children, autopsy demonstrated that they had, con they had features. Sorry, one second there. I just have to open up my pen. So autopsy demonstrated that they had features consistent with a narrow, small nasal maxillary complex, with or without mandibular ret retroposition. All children were concluded to have died as a result of hypoxia during sleep. Our obstructive sleep apnea children presented similar complaints and similar facial features. Anatomic risk factors for a narrow upper airway can be determined early in life, and these traits are often genetic. Their presence should lead to greater attention to sleep complaints um, in children. And who is in the best position to be identifying this but the family dentist? The child is going to the dentist so frequently, more so than the medical doctor. The adult is going to their dentist more frequently, more so than their medical doctor. So there's an information here and a tremendous role for dentists to play. It's all yours, Dittmar.
I can't hear you. Gosh, gosh, Patrick, we couldn't have timed that better, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and a very balanced presentation. Um, we could have we could go on for yes, hours. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time. But what we would like to do is invite you again in future, and possibly, and not just possibly, but once travel is um, possible. We'd love to invite you to South Africa. Well, my I wife is working beside me on another office desk and she would love to go to South Africa. We'd love to have <laughs> you. Um, we've had a number of questions, um, some really interesting ones. Um, but I think what I would like to pose to you to start off with is one of the mm -hmm. biggest questions that I had when I started and when our colleagues that are involved um, and want to get started is where do they start their journey? What, what, what is your thought? Where do we start our journey as a dentist who hasn't been involved in airway dentistry before? I think the first thing is really to be observant. You know, um, I find that a lot of dentists start their journey with themselves, that they're already waking up at a dry mouth in the morning and they're snoring or, you know, they're having issues with that or they see it in their children. Sometimes it happens very close to home. And, you know, I think as well that when dentists are seeing children coming in and adults coming in and they're, they're just even just to be observing the high upper narrow palate and talk to the patients, ask them, like ask them the questions. Do you feel sleepy? You know, are you, does, has anybody ever said that you stop breathing during your sleep? And it's not that you're making a diagnosis, but you're just making the connection there because a lot of these kids and adults, they're, they're overlooked and they're really falling between the cracks of medicine and dentistry. And as like, I really feel that the dental industry has such a pivotal role to play with this one because, and it's too broad now, you know, that the function of the dentist is so important they are so well trained to spot these risk factors. And if these risk factors are present, it's not good. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> do you feel that myofunctional um, treatment, um, myofunctional dentistry has a role to play? It's vital. It's absolutely necessary. You know, we have, if, if we look at the literature of different studies, investigating the instance of persistent mouth breathing in children. It's ranging between 25 and 50%. Now I spoke about Karen Bonnock's study and Karen Bonnock's study is going to be very relevant, yeah. of course, to, to, you know, to, to any um, Western country. And I'm just going to pull it off because I think, I think it's an important one and I'll pull it off very, very quickly. So she looked at 11,000 children in Stratford upon Avon. It was published in the journal Pediatrics in 2012. So I'm just going to go straight to it. So sleep disorder breathing overall was associated with a near increased risk, 40% increased risk of special education needs. And this was if the child was not treated in the first five years of life. So they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, the issue with sleep disorder breathing and mouth breathing contributes to this. Mouth breathing is a factor which is contributing. So the hallmarks, given the dynamic multi-symptom expression of sleep disorder breathing, hallmark symptoms, snoring, apnea, and mouth breathing. So a child who is persistently mouth breathing you know, nasal obstruction, and they may not just, they may not need to have nasal obstruction, just the fact that they have mouth breathing because of habit. Um, mm. We have to be looking at that. Yeah, economically, morally, socially, we have to be telling children, we cannot be overlooking it. Mm. So in your opinion, and in your experience over the years, it is definitely um, um, it is definitely uh, uh, appropriate for us to look at starting treatment early in children yes. once we yes. recognize those signs and yes. symptoms. Yes, yes. The form of growth, if you think of a child's face, the, when, when is the child's face growing the quickest? 
you know, any parent will tell you that the child is growing quickest. How do you know? You know by when they have to change the clothes of that child so quickly. You buy a jumper and a trousers today, and in two months' time, the child has grown out of it. When does that happen most? Up to the age of five years of age. So early, early intervention is very important. And I think it's much more important than leaving it until 12 years of age because the statistics are that 90% of the growth of the face is achieved by 12 years of age. And 60%, I think, is by age four. So yeah. it's a very brief window of opportunity, but like it's still never too late. It, like if a youngster said to me, they have a mouth breathing pattern or mouth breathing habit, should they change it? Absolutely. I was 27 years of age, but it still yeah. made an enormous difference to my life. And I have to say, that you put, we put children through school and through university education and we demand these kids to be able to concentrate. And mm. as healthcare professionals, who is telling these kids how to concentrate and helping them to concentrate in terms of getting better sleep quality? You cannot concentrate if you're not having adequate sleep quality. And mm. I'm not talking about sleep hygiene and staying up late or anything like that. The elephant in the room here is nasal breathing. We can do all of the sleep, sleep hygiene in the world. But if that child or adult has their mouth open during sleep, it doesn't matter. That's it. Absolutely. So in other words, if I interpret, interpret you correctly, you're not, um, you're not um, against straight teeth, but yes. we need to have straight teeth within a balanced environment, which is both structural, functional, and, and, and airways. Yes, the real thing here is to ask the question, why is, the, why is the teeth crooked? And while looking at overcrowding of teeth to identify, are there black triangles of either side of the jaw, is the jaw too narrow? And if the jaw is too narrow, it presents that there's something more going on there. And that's where, you know, not just expansion in the width, but ideally to get forward growth of the face, because we said that the human airway, you know, a good airway is the size of our tongue. And if we have jaws that are set back, that airway is going to be compromised. And it's much better, much easier to be able to identify these early on in the child's life. And there's a couple of other things here. Tutogenesis, which affects between 10 and 20 percent of the population. So children who are, are teenagers congenitally, they're missing teeth. They are also very high risk factors for sleep disorder breathing and also is extraction of teeth. So anything that we do to make the jaws smaller is not ideal. You know, we need the jaws to be nice, nice and, um, you know, adequate U-shaped to be able to house all teeth. Um, we don't want smaller jaws. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. I've taken up a lot of your time. Just um, a couple of questions. Well, we've been flooded with questions. Um, obviously, there've been, the, there been those wonderful welcomes from all over the country. Um, my friend, Jani Wurstazen has welcomed you. She's in Bloemfontein. Then there's Professor Mark Gilman, who, by the way, um, I believe is the man who, 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 who demystified the whole uh, nitrous oxide mystery. Um, and Professor Mark Gilman, he's a wonderful man. And he asked the question, is there research to show that regular prana yoga improves nasal breathing? I'm not aware of it. Um, there could very well be. Um, I suppose the real question here is that when we have somebody deliberately change their breathing patterns, we get them to underbreed. And we, we ask them to underbreed to the point of air hunger. Children's exercises, the exercise that we're doing are very strategically um, there to improve breathing pattern disorders. And I think the key aspect is not just to improve breathing pattern disorders while you have the child or adult in the studio, but to get them to bring these breathing patterns into everyday life. We, we aren't teaching a breathing technique. We are showing that if children or adults breathe through an open mouth, if they breathe fast and if they breathe shallow, it will contribute adversely to their health. So pranayama will depend on how the instructor, how it's taught. And a lot of children are not great at doing slow breathing. So I don't typically teach slow breathing to children, but I teach a lot of exercise yeah. involving movement. And, you know, okay. the, the kids themselves, 
you can get the child to breathe in through the nose, out through the nose, pinch the nose and start walking around holding their breath to build up air hunger. And that will open up the nose. So since 1923, breath holding has been shown to open up the nose. And pranayama, when it involves air hunger and extended breath holding or suspension of the breath will also help open up the nose, yes. Wonderful. And of course, now the big question, is your technique of holding the breath similar to the half technique? Wim You've Hoff, been asked this. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> Wim Hof is different though. So like the Wim Hof technique is a stressor. So it's kind of, it's, it's targeting a different dimension. It's like somebody going to a gym and you could do high intensity training. That's the Wim Hof technique. Whereas ours is more functional. Um, and it's about bringing the technique into everyday life. So yeah, it's different. It's different. And we, we don't do hyperventilation, um, you know, prior to the breath holding. With the oxygen advantage, we do so, some of the exercise, but with Buteco, we don't. Yes, absolutely. I know this question gets asked so often. And then another question is, can melatonin supplementation help in reducing sleep apnea? That I don't know. No, it's not quite. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It'll certainly help you with your sleep. Very but diplomatic. Then you, have to ask, you know, the other thing is, like, stress is going to impact melatonin. So if, yeah. you know, when we can adopt functional breathing, we as human beings, we cannot be switched on all the time. And many of us are, you know, workload and jobs and society and everything else. And this is one thing about the breath, that by switching to nose breathing, by breathing low and by breathing slow and yeah. always slowing down the exhalation, if you want to bring the body into relaxation to help with achieving a deeper sleep at night, the last yeah. 10 or 15 minutes before you go to sleep, have your mouth closed, focus on the air coming in and out of your nose and really work on slowing down the exhalation. Absolutely. So you're taking a very soft and light breath to come into your nose and a really relaxed and a slow exhalation. And by extending the exhalation, you stimulate the vagus nerve, you bring the body into relaxation. That's more conducive to a deep sleep. Absolutely. And then one question just related to the nasomaxillary complex. Does it mean from your presentation that, the, that a narrow nasomaxillary complex is one of the causes of cot death in babies and how to diagnose it? It could be a contributory factor. If you look at that paper that we looked at, death and nasomaxillary complex, that's what the, the research was there. And we have to bear in mind, the researcher was Dr. Christian Guimano was the lead researcher. Yeah. Um, so when, he's, when he puts his, his pen to paper, I would be taking it seriously. Absolutely. But those children had died because of a hypoxia during sleep. And the only thing preceding death was a runny nose. To think something so harmless, but the fact was, they already had a compromised airway. And if Absolutely. you have a compromised airway with nasal obstruction, what does the child do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Patrick, they've been wonderful comments, just wonderful information. Thanks for sharing. Um, do you think oral hygienists can assist more with these matters and how will it be practically possible? Very, very sure, for sure. Yeah. We've, we, we've had a lot of dental hygienists um, train in this and probably dental hygienists because it kind of goes hand in hand with their work you know do yeah. they see the children and adults coming in who are persistently mouth breathing what is their dental health like because yes. we have to ask the question what's the role of saliva in the human mouth does it serve to protect the teeth and if your mouth is open and you're breathing through the mouth there's a 42 percent greater water loss out through the mouth we're more likely to be dehydrated and the mouth is more likely to be dry Absolutely. Patrick, I think we'll need to conclude because load shedding is about to hit most of us. Um, <laughs> power blackout, not load shedding. But, uh, we'll pretend. The, um, um, just to remind the um, participants, if you want to participate in that and answer that question for one of Patrick's books that's been autographed, please, when you answer the question, just put your name next to your answer so that we know who you are, because the survey is anonymous. So if you post and it hasn't got your name, we won't know that it's you. And please let us know how to contact you. So maybe just your name and a um, cell phone number. 
Patrick, thank you very, very much. It's been wonderful seeing you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And um, during these times of COVID, um, which have been just as hard in Ireland as they have been here, mm -hmm. look after yourself, take care, and stay well. Thank you, doctor. Take care. Okay. Bye. Pleasure. Take care, Patrick. Bye.